The Locked On Podcast Network presents The Big Six in 60. The six biggest national sports stories from the local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. Get the real story. Why it matters, what's next, who wins the big game, and more, all in 60 minutes. The Big Six in 60 starts now with the biggest story in sports. The Baltimore Ravens and Cincinnati Bengals face off in a big Thursday night matchup. Both you are locked on NFL crossover, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Guys, the Ravens enter this game at 6-3. and three. Cincinnati, they need a win in order to essentially keep their season alive, traveling down to Baltimore. Joe Burrow versus Lamar Jackson. We saw these two teams match up just essentially a couple weeks ago, back in week five. And, man, that's game of the year type stuff right there. Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson putting on master classes, but the Ravens come out on top in overtime. So with the Bengals, guys, let's start on the offensive side of the ball. And, Jake, I'll throw it to you first here. For the Bengals, what's the biggest storyline on offense? Because Joe Burrow's playing lights out football right now, but there are some injuries on that side of the ball to monitor. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. Hit the nail on the head there. Joe Burrow is playing at an MVP level, and I know that Lamar Jackson is the other quarterback in the NFL playing at an MVP level, so not to take anything away from Lamar, but Joe Burrow's right there with him, in my opinion, in the way that he's played, especially coming into form in terms of pocket management, pocket feel, on full display against the Las Vegas Raiders. And while the Las Vegas Raiders did beat the Ravens earlier this year, I think we can all agree that they're not a very good football team. And Max Crosby not having necessarily even his best season, despite him being a good player on that Vegas defense. That said, Joe Burrow was excellent in extending plays and making things happen. And he was doing that without left tackle Orlando Brown, who missed a game, which is generally unheard of, as Ravens fans are probably familiar with for the very durable left tackle for the Bengals. T. Higgins, doubtful this week for the second straight week. So they're going to be shorthanded. Eric All now on IR with an ACL injury. Zach Moss with a, a neck injury that's landed him on IR out indefinitely. So that's four pretty important players for this Bengals offense that have some sort of status. Orlando Brown is questionable this week. With all that going on around him, though, Joe Burrow is still playing at that very high level. And if that can continue then the offense can keep doing what it's doing. But I do think that it gets harder against the Ravens defense, despite the issues they've had all year. And I do think the Bengals will be able to pass the ball probably, just given the way these teams played last time, the way the season's gone for each team. But that's definitely harder and requires guys to step up. All eyes on Jermaine Burton. Can he bounce back after a healthy scratch last week and disciplinary issues instead of T. Higgins? Can they get something going for Jamar Chase when there's going to be a ton of attention paid there that challenge is there, but when you have Joe Burrow playing at this level, that is still an encouraging sign for this offense going forward despite the injuries. Yeah, and injuries are a tough part of the game in Cincinnati dealing with them on the offensive side of the ball. And I know, James, for the offense, obviously we know what Joe Burrow has done, Jamar Chase, but the running game, I think, is something for Cincinnati that – a lot of people are wondering, with Chase Brown now the guy, the Bengals bring in Khalil Herbert, how important is it for them to establish this ground game against the Ravens defense that's been pretty stout against the run this season? Yeah, I think they need to be the two E's, efficient and explosive. Can you steal two explosive runs on Thursday night? Because that would be great <laughs> if you could, whether it's Chase Brown or Khalil Herbert. And efficiency uh, is certainly the key. Just being able to get Joe Burrow in, in second and six, uh, or maybe Khalil Herbert, who's been good in, in short yardage situations throughout his career. Maybe he helps them on third and one when they need it. And they've struggled in those situations at times, even though Joe's been awesome on third down, uh, they haven't necessarily been great uh, in third and short situations. So uh, I do think that the run game is important. I don't expect them to run the ball a ton. I don't, I, because I, I'm not sure they're going to be able to. To your point, the Ravens are good against the run. You have Joe Burrow. It's a pass-first Bengals offense against a, a Ravens defense that has been susceptible to the pass. But if they can be efficient, if you're telling me that they're averaging 4-1 to 4-3 a carry, I would sign up for that right now, even if it meant no explosive runs. Uh, maybe my expectations are low or my barometer is low, but I, I just I, I'm not going into this game thinking, all right, no Zach Moss, who was a valuable piece of their backfield. Khalil Herbert, who's going to take the field. I do expect him to play. We'll see if he actually does. But 
having like 40 hours in the Bengals system. Uh, you know, it's not like he's going to be uh, have the expanded playbook there. And, and then Chase Brown, who's a, a really good player and is going to start for them, and I, I think is ascending. But I, I'm not sure this offensive line is built to to go manhandle the Ravens in Baltimore. Yeah, Baltimore, one of the top rush defenses in the league, and the Bengals right now 24th in terms of yards per attempt on the ground. But let's flip it over to defense, guys, because this Cincinnati defense, despite how high-powered the offense has been this season, the defense has certainly struggled at times. And in this first matchup between the Bengals and the Ravens, both defenses struggled to contain both quarterbacks. And I know for the Cincinnati defense, it was tough to contain Lamar Jackson. So what is the biggest storyline on the defensive side of the ball for the Bengals as they look to try to combat this high-powered Baltimore offense? Well, they didn't make a trade at the deadline. They didn't add any help there. We were hoping they would. Maybe the trade partners just didn't emerge. There were a few edge rushers traded in the weeks leading up to. And on the trade deadline day itself, the Bengals were not one of the teams that acquired a piece there. The Ravens offense, meanwhile, continues to click on all cylinders. They score 41 against the Bengals, but that's in a streak of games where they go 28, 35, 41, 30, 41, 24, 41. 24 being the low mark there on the road in Cleveland in the Jameis Winston game. Uh, or his first game, the Jameis Winston bump, I guess you could call it, for the Cleveland Browns that week. Point is, is that the Ravens offense continues to click. The Bengals defense has been able to show up against the bad teams in the NFL, and it's truly some of the worst teams in the NFL where the defense has played okay. Against the Ravens, they couldn't get stops, and they didn't add a player to help them get those stops. So this week it's like, okay, can Miles Murphy take advantage of a matchup with Roger Rosengarten? on the right side of that Bengals offense. And even when they got pressure, the last time these teams played, as you point out, Kevin, they couldn't get Lamar to the ground. And that was such a big issue. They generally did a pretty good job until overtime against that Ravens running game, in my opinion. Derrick Henry rips off a 51-yard run in overtime to take a stat line from 14 for 40 to 15 for 90. So that's a big difference in the game, right? But they generally did a pretty good job against the run there at the expense of not being able to handle the pass and not being able to string plays together and really having to gamble. So can they be more consistent this week against Baltimore? Can they get Lamar to the ground when they get pressure there? Those are the big questions, the big stories after they didn't do anything to help a defense that, in our opinion, on lockdown Bengals clearly needed some help at the deadline. Yeah, and James, I have to ask this about the star of that Bengals defense. How do you stop Trey Hendrickson? I mean, just, just, just how do you do it? Four sacks against the Raiders last week. He is such a dominant force. I know a lot of people are looking forward to any and all snaps that Ronnie Stanley and Trey Hendrickson go up against each other. That's like the battle of the Titans over there. How important is he to this Bengals defense? And what does he do to the ceiling and the floor of what they do? Yeah. When he's playing at, at an elite level and they need him to, you want to talk about a, a, a key to every game, but certainly on the road, you, you talk about disrupting Lamar Jackson. They need Trey Hendrickson to be that guy. And he he's so dominant at times. And there's been other games where you don't necessarily notice 91. And I think that that's because he is going to command attention. And, and he is really the lone guy that uh, has been able to consistently get pressure this year. And so stopping him, well, I, I hope John Harbaugh is listening because I'm not sure you can necessarily stop him when he's dialed in and playing at the level that uh, we've seen. The Raiders let him pad his stats a little bit with the, their injuries. That helped, for sure. <laughs> um, but but he's got to play at, at a really, really high level, and, and we know how talented he is. But just defensive line-wise, can someone help him? That That's what I'm looking for. Sheldon Rankins was signed for a reason, and uh, our, our listeners certainly are aware of this. We haven't really noticed 98 all year. And so Thursday night would be a good time for 98 to help 91, they were teammates back in New Orleans. It, it would be nice uh, to see a Sheldon Rankin signing uh, where he's able to get some pressure on Lamar Jackson. I think that's a huge, huge key and storyline going into Thursday's game. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. And that winning $5 bet could be on an early week 11 line in the NFL. 
There's a theory that teams get a bump from firing a coach, but what happens when they fire a coach and trade one of their best players? FanDuel is kind of buying the fired coach hype as it feels like the New Orleans Saints aren't as much of an underdog as you might expect to the Atlanta Falcons. The game is in New Orleans, but the FanDuel has the Falcons favored by three and a half points. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. The voice of Sunday Night Football on NBC is our guest. You are Locked On Lions, your daily Detroit Lions podcast. Mike Tarico is with us from NBC, getting ready for Detroit and Houston. Michael, great to see you. You too, Matt. I'm just doing a quick count in my head here. <clears throat> How many times we've seen the Lions of late? I can think of like five off the top of my head from, <clears throat> from the last game of the 22 season. Yeah. And then on, on through 23 and a couple of playoff games and opening night against the Rams of this year and now this. So, yeah, it's been fun. And uh, this should be a good game. Houston – uh, coming off the 10 days, uh, struggled, obviously, against the Jets. Uh, we'll see if they get a little bit healthier. But, and these are two teams that show you how quick things can flip. If in, I don't know, November of 22, so two years ago, I would have said to you, yeah, Lions and Texans will be a midseason Sunday night football game. Be like, right. There's no way under the sun. And here they are two years later, Texans. They've had a little bit of a patch, but they are clearly the best team in their division and one of the four or five teams in the AFC that looks like a playoff team. And the Lions are as good as, if not better than, anybody in the NFC. And right there with the Chiefs is the best team in the league. How have you been, first and foremost? Uh, here we are in early November. We're kind of halfway through the yeah. year. Feel, feeling good? You're uh, you're getting your rest? Yeah, yeah, whatever. We we hit we hit our halfway point uh, this week. This is the halfway of our season when you throw in opening night, Thursday night, 18 Sunday nights of preseason and a couple of playoff games um, for us. And, you know, I've been, I've been going since the Olympics uh, in July pretty much. We got back home for a week and then was right into our preseason. So it's been good. It's been a great run. And, you know, that's the joy of the league, especially the Sunday night games. You, you move around, you get to a good game, you get to see a team you otherwise wouldn't, like Minnesota, now 6-2, and two, you know, still a game behind the lines, even though it feels like it's more right now for whatever reason. But got to see them on Sunday night, and they were not on our schedule, but they were worth seeing. I, I like what they're doing. I think they've got a really good team. So that, that keeps you energized. You know, these little surprise teams that show up. We'll go see uh, Coach Harbaugh and the Chargers next week. That was not on our schedule, but we'll see them against Burrow and the Bengals. So that aspect of it, uh, keeps you on edge and makes it fun as well. I know Jim always loves seeing you, a couple of Ann Arbor guys, <laughs> right? He, he, he'll, he, I remember when you guys waved to each other at the basketball game years ago. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Co Coach Harbs, gosh, you know, so I'm, I'm going to say it was in the 90s, I played in Coach Harbaugh's charity golf tournament at the U course at Michigan. Mm. Um, when he, you know, getting towards the end of his playing days. Uh, so like I've known Jim Harbaugh for 30 something years, which is, which is kind of crazy. And, you know, covered him as a player. I was in the studio then, but covered him as a player. And then obviously, you know, at uh, Stanford and then Michigan and, you know, back in the league before with the Niners and now here with the Chargers. He's done a nice job that you can say a lot of things about Jim Harbaugh. One thing you must say and must admit to, he walks in the building changes a culture, has an impact on a team immediately. And he, he's done that again with the Chargers. Tell me about watching the tape uh, and, and how much you got to see, because I know you're getting ready for your game, but the 425 game last week. I mean, the Lions go in in the rain. Mm -hmm. You've heard the, 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 the Jared Goff nonsense before, but can't win uh, in cold weather. Of course, the game you did, he knocked off Aaron Rodgers and ended their season and right. ended Rodgers' career in Green Bay. But what was that like to peep in on that and see that the Lions were, were pulling away in that game in the third quarter at Lambeau? Yeah. It, it's fascinating. I watched the first half as we were getting to the booth in Minnesota. I've watched the rest of the game subsequent to that, Matt. Um, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I thought of that when I saw that it was a rain game and uh, Aaron Andrews has been a friend for a long time, does a terrific job as a sideline reporter. Her first report was about golf and wearing gloves in the bad yeah. weather. And uh, it, it took me back to that game you just referenced, the end of the Rodgers era in Green Bay when the Lions kept the Packers out of the playoffs. And that game, there was a cold weather game, I want to say at Chicago, and I don't want to swear to that earlier that year. Um, there may have been a game 
is that the year that they played both teams at MetLife, the Jets and Giants? Correct. Too? Yeah. 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 So yeah. one of those games, perhaps the Giants game, was windy and cold, and Goff wasn't as good as he was at Ford Field, and I thought he was not great in the first half of that Green Bay game two years ago, but got a lot better. But I thought I saw a quarterback in two years who has gotten more comfortable playing in those conditions and just played, played a better brand of football and knowing what to do. And I, I thought in listening to Tom's comments, Brady, he was kind of taking a little bit through the mindset of a quarterback in a game like that. Extra care, careful with throws, even fewer risks on throws and things like that. And look, Jared Goff, one, has been – incredibly accurate, incredibly smart with the ball, uh, taking sacks instead of putting balls up for grabs, keeping the keeping the ball with the Lions, let them kick it away and come back on the next drive, using the weapons, Ben Johnson getting people open, drawing things up. It's been as good a season as any quarterback has had in the NFL, and I know Lamar Jackson's out there with his running ability, but when you look at the very few incompletions, that's that's a lot. That, that's in, that's impressive, and it, he's running as as explosive an offense as there is in the league right now. So um, I, I thought it said a lot about golf, and it said a lot about the team. This is truly an anytime, anywhere team, even though the schedule didn't give him a lot of outdoor games this year. You, you know, how much of, of this is just he's got the chip on his shoulder. He was traded away. It, it's still there. He still talks about it. But how much of it is Ben Johnson and just continuity? I mean, you, know, you interview coaches and players all the time and, you know, teams that go through and recycle coaches all the time. But this is this group's now been together for four, almost four years. Yeah, it's continuity. It's quality. It's a great scheme. It's really good players. But Jerry Goff's a good player. Number one overall pick of the draft. Don't forget that. Sometimes people do, you know, 100 million people see the Super Bowl. So when it's a 13 to three game and you don't have a lot of success throwing the ball and it's the early part of your career and you know, you're, you're not the guy putting up 25, 28 points. You go, okay, well maybe he's one type of quarterback and you get a mindset, but I think it speaks to being in the right place at the right time for Jared being in this place at this time after his LA experience, the chip on his shoulder is great conversation, but it's real. And I'm sure it's part of the fuel here, but don't let any of that overtake like a quality, quality arm and a good player just because he's not the mobile quarterback who runs for that first down per half. I always like to think about the quarterbacks like uh, Lamar Jackson does it sometimes more than once, but Mahomes, uh, Mayfield, right? With Stafford in his prime and certainly still now will run you for one first down a half, right? On third down when a team plays man, turns their backs to the quarterback, and he just takes off and takes the eight yards, right? Not that Jared, Jared hasn't or can't do that, but that's not the main crux of his game. But even given that, like this is a qu- high-quality thrower of the ball, processor of information, uh, a guy whose accuracy cannot be overstated. Matt, we see so many inaccurate passers, and it's hard. I mean, you, you get 10 people – around you in a circle you're trying to find that little space to throw the ball and have accurate feet and all that that's hard as heck for those guys right and uh, he's just done it at a super high level here the last couple of years and this stretch of you know a couple of dozen incompletions in the last five games or so is just it's just nuts Lions and Texans coming up Sunday night Mike's got the call with Chris Collinsworth Melissa Stark on NBC at uh, 8 20 um Interesting. Uh, I watched the Chiefs, obviously. I'm sure you did the other night on the F4 Letter mm-hmm. Network. They get to 8 0. Are the Lions better than Kansas City? Could you make a case for Detroit being the best team? Not just the best team in the NFC, but the best team in the NFL? You, you, can, you can make a case. They have lost a game. So, just on pure results, we've seen that. You know, what the Lions have done in dominating people, which is certainly a great quality of a championship team, the Chiefs have shown that great quality of a great team by finding a way to win every week and doing it in different ways. Um, you know, what would what would Vegas say on a neutral field between the two teams? Probably the Chiefs a slight favorite given pedigree and all that stuff, right? They're, they're super close. When you start going group by group, right, the offensive group, both teams are good. The Lions offense is more explosive right now than the Chiefs offense because of all the injuries they've had. Uh, so I think overall they're over there. The defensive side of the ball, 
the Lions are right there with Kansas City. You know, Kansas City has done such a good job with Steve Spagnuolo's defense. And I think, you know, watching most of the Lions games this year, they have seen everyone. Aaron Glenn's done a really good job with getting the pieces of this defense to play the defense he wants, to marry all this stuff. Now it's trying to make up for life without Hutch uh, for these last three three games or so, coming up a four here. Um, it's that, that difference maker up front and Chris Jones for Kansas City is something that Detroit can't match. I know Lee McNeil is strong inside and very good, and he's kind of cranked it up a little bit in the pass rush game. You now, there are some McNeil plays that are not sacks, but are just as important when he yeah. drives that interior guy back into the quarterback's feet and changes everything in the offense. Uh, but Chris Jones has guys on his edge and gets to the quarterback and has been doing it at an all-pro level the last few years. Uh, when I worked at John Gruden, like one of the things that always was just ingrained in my mind was fourth quarter pass rush. If you're going to be a championship team, you have to have fourth quarter pass rush. So can Zedarius Smith bring that and be that to give the Lions that one that one thing that maybe they the Kansas City has that Detroit at the moment doesn't have? What do you think of the Smith signing? And, and obviously mm-hmm. you're following it. People are saying, oh, they should go get Miles Garrett. They should go get Max Crosby. How would you rate uh, what they did going out and getting Zadarius Smith? Well, you can't get a guy unless he's available, right? It sounds like Max Crosby wasn't going to be available. Miles Garrett, similar type thing. Now, everybody in every <laughs> every business is available for the right price, right? But there's realistic and stupid. And what the Lions are trying to do is build here for a longer run. And why hold on to draft picks? Why do draft picks matter? Well, now that you've extended – five or six guys with a lot of money paid out to these guys, those draft picks are going to become even more important because they're going to have to play. If you want to go back, you just mentioned Kansas City. Let's go back to them, Matt. Like yeah. Kansas City's success on the defensive side of the ball has been the draft. Oh yeah. You start, you start looking around. The draft two years ago, three years ago now, that draft has a ton of starters on the defensive side of the ball, four or five, uh, over the last couple of years acquired by Brett, Brett Veach in the draft. Because they have Patrick Mahomes on a huge contract, right? And now Chris Jones as well. So as the Lions have done these extensions to keep this core in its prime together, those draft picks are going to have to hit. So, yeah, Miles Garrett would have been great to go add if this was the last year of the history of the NFL. And you didn't have to worry about drafting guys in a couple <laughs> of years. you know. Right. Uh, so I, I, I get it. You're not going to offer two ones to go get a guy for eight or nine games. Because can you sign him? Can you afford another guy? Hutch is going to have to get a big deal. So I, I get what they did and why they did. Uh, the other stuff sounded like great pie-in-the-sky stuff. Um, but this was a good acquisition for a very reasonable price. I thought they may have gotten another lower-level type edge rusher um, to go along with it, maybe for a conditional seventh or a flop of sevenths. But um, if Brad Holmes got the – best available guy i think given the pass rushers that were on the market and knowing you were a need team you think nfl teams were lining up to give the lions a an edge rusher as soon as one guy gets hurt your 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 compensation meter goes up a little bit because they know you got to be desperate so uh, i thought it was a good acquisition smith's been a good player over the years knows the division like the fact that he comes in with a green bay minnesota chip on his shoulder quote unquote Uh, and i think knowing zadarius a little bit from covering him with the Packers and the Vikings briefly as well. I think he'll fit right into the room. You are locked on Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast. Right now, the Steelers, uh, as a, as a, you know, for commanders fans that are familiar, they made two uh, depth moves that the Steelers did, and it wasn't blockbuster moves. They wasn't guys that are going to, you know, break, you know, break the mold, but Mike Williams, a deep threat receiver. And he talked about that today at the Steelers facility saying, oh yeah, I'm excited to play with Russell Wilson and catch some of those moon balls. He's not going to be the number one wide receiver, might be the number two wide receiver, but he gives the Steelers another outside threat like George Pickens, who Russell Wilson, he, he, he has a high yards per average or yards per yards per attempt, excuse me, uh, overall. And I, the, I think the best yards per attempt of any got person that's attempted at least 20 play action passes so far this season. And that's what the Steelers want to do. They want to hit you deep and then they want to run the ball and then they want to catch you in play action. And so 
that's what they're trying to hit. Mike Williams fits that piece of the puzzle for what they're trying to do on offense. Similarly, Preston Smith isn't the end-all be-all because they have their edge rushers. In fact, Nick Herbig's back to practicing this week. A good sign that he's going to be able to play again. TJ Watt, Alex Highsmith, your starters. Herbig's your solid three. But they wanted four. They had Marcus Golden in training camp. He was going to play for them. He retired mid-training camp. They didn't really make a move after that. Preston Smith now is that fourth edge now. But he's also a more physical, bigger edge than Nick Herbig. And I think that's the thing here. Both these moves were puzzle pieces to the overall picture that the Steelers want to be right now. And that's a team that runs the ball well, hits you for big plays, puts you in guessing games on offense, and then plays tough, stymie in defense, which I think is going to be really interesting to to, to collide with the commanders who have been great at running the football to start this year. Yeah, man, you talk about guessing games, and I'm so glad you said that because that's going to come back here in today's crossover Thursday episode. Remember that, because that's going to come back in this episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yeah, man, I mean, I really dig Mike Williams. I really thought that, you know, I really thought that was going to do a lot, like a lot of people. I expect the Jets to be a lot better than they have been uh, so far this season. I really thought Mike Williams, once he was able to get his legs fresh and and get going from, from recovering from that major injury, would be able to be a bigger part of that. Obviously, it didn't work out. And when you look at the Pittsburgh Steelers, man, you know, commanders, commanders, listeners, or locked on commanders, listeners know this. We talked about this quite a few times throughout the season, starting off with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in week one, that really what, what scares me about this Washington Commanders defense this season are teams that have multiple weapons. And I'm not even talking like two weapons. I'm talking like three, four options. Uh, you know, Pat Fryer certainly is a guy that can have uh, uh, games that can really impact what goes on with the game flow. So I really like what the Steelers did from an outside NFL perspective, clearly, would rather they held off for a week if it was possible. I know <laughs> it's not possible, but it would have been nice if they held off for a week. But, hey, you want to see teams at their best because if you can beat them at their best, then it means uh, a whole lot more. And then, of course, Preston Smith has history uh, in Washington. So there's a lot of people who have been Washington fans for a long time um, that, again, maybe not looking forward to seeing him coming back the way that he's coming back, but certainly a name that that people uh, will will understand. Let's talk about that offense a little bit more. Let's, let's get into what has been – so effective about this offense this season because Dan Quinn, like you just mentioned, really went in depth and really praised Russell Wilson's uh, deep ball. And that is something that Jaden Daniels has done very, very well. Uh, third right now and in, in, in expected points added in his deep ball passing, according to uh, Zebra Sports Next Gen Stats, which is a great stat. But Russell Wilson, he, you know, in this matchup, he's the OG, right? He's been doing it for a minute. So what's been going on with that Steelers offense specifically that's been so successful, even though they've switched through quarterbacks? They're they're finding balance, and that's the thing, David, is that they are tr- they're hitting you in multiple ways. Arthur Smith knew the new offensive coordinator for the Steelers that came in this year for the Steelers' offense to be good. It wasn't going to rely on one superstar. It wasn't going to rely on you know ex superstar quarterback play. It was going to be about hey. Najee Harris is a good running back. Jalen Warren's a good number two running back. This offensive line is decent. George Pickens is a serious threat, but maybe not like Justin Jefferson in, in that upper tier of guys just yet. Pat Frymuth is a really good tight end. So, hey, we got all these guys, and we got a speedster like Calvin Austin, a big dude like Darnell Washington. What if we combine all of them in ways that make you honor each of them, and you need a quarterback to conduct that offense? Now, for the first six games, Justin Fields did a good job protecting the football, using his legs and being part of that. But what Justin Fields couldn't do was he couldn't see the field consistently and distribute the football to all those different guys and and mix those weapons to the best of their potential. Russell Wilson in two games had started to do that and and, and do that more efficiently. I think he did it really well from like the later half of the second quarter in his first game on to the rest of the last game. And then against Mm -hmm. the Giants, he really had it like about the, there was about three possessions. They should have had touchdowns where things out of his control uh, just didn't work, work in their favor. Uh, but he's getting that. And that's, what's making it dangerous because now for years, I've said this for years, Najee Harris is the only running back to have a th- three straight thousand yard seasons in the last three years in the NFL. That shows his durability. But I've said for years, he's much better than just that because the Steelers offensive line was struggling and they had no serious passing game to worry about. So people weren't, we're saying where well, our priority is to stop Najee Harris. Don't let him get going. But now teams have to honor Najee Harris, uh, honor the passing game. They have to honor other things in this offense. And that has forced teams to kind of leave away. And now you got three straight games oh. where Najee Harris has over a hundred rushing yards. And that's what makes this Steelers offense better this year. Yeah. And going up against Washington Bears run defense. Look, I mean, just the truth is being what it is. Rush defense has not been their strong suit uh, this season. Although I will tell you, Steelers fans, if you're just looking at that Giants game, you're like, look at all that production the Giants put up against the Washington Commanders defense. I will tell you the second half 
much less run game uh, production for the Giants in the first half. So there was mm -hmm. a, there were adjustments made. Now, some of that was game flow, too. The Giants had to pass more down multiple touchdowns, all that kind of stuff as well. So certainly layers of context, as there always is in the National Football League. But but Chris, we got, of course, we got to talk about that defense. And I mean, T.J. Watt, like if, if he's not the best pass rush in the National Football League, I don't know who is three and a half sacks against the NFC East so far, which <laughs> much more of an interesting stat than an actual Crazy. applicable stat to this game. It's not like, well, he got sacks against the Giants and Cowboys, so he's going to sack the Commanders. This is not really how this works, but three and a half sacks in two games against the NFC East, nonetheless, kind of just illustrates how good TJ Watt is. The Washington Commanders uh, have been doing a lot of chip blocking. It's something that I went really in depth with last week going up against that Giants pass rush. Mm -hmm. TJ Watt's going to see a lot of chip blocks in this game. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets chipped on every single play. Is that going to be enough, though, to stop TJ. And even if it is, is dedicating that many resources to TJ Watt going to impact what the Steelers are able to do on, on around him? I'm glad you brought that up because the Steelers are starting to counter that a little bit. And I broke that down after the Giants game. Yeah, I went back in the Giants game. There were four times. Typically, TJ Watt lines up over the right tackle, Alex Highsmith over the left. That is just the rule. That is the law. In the Giants game, four times they flipped sides. And that may not sound, sound like a lot, but if you go back the rest of this season, the rest of the, the all of 2023, the all of 2022, and the all of 2021, the last three seasons plus the first eight games combined for the Steelers, or seven games combined for the Steelers, he had four times that they flipped before that. So in that one game, and I asked Alex Heisman, hey, was that part of the plan? And he was like, oh, yes, we've noticed everyone's chipping TJ now with a tight end and extra alignment and a running back. So what we're doing is we're going to move him around. And in the game, if you go back and you look at the highlights of that Giants game, the game, the, the, the play where he sacked Daniel Jones, ripped the ball out, picked it up himself, they left him in single. Why? They forgot to check into it. And so what they're going to try to do to Jaden Daniels in this game is they're going to be flipping TJ a lot. And now with Preston Smith, if he's active enough for this game and they have all four of their guys – they're going to do that with all with all four of them, and I think there's going to be some sets where they have three men at the same time that are outside linebackers and moving around, and it's mm -hmm. going to force the commander's offense to communicate, where is 90? Where is 90? And if you're doing that, oftentimes – you can some you can be there, be there and be, but sometimes you overcorrect and then you forget, oh, wait a minute, Cam Hayward's going up A gap. That's what the Steelers yeah. want to create. They want to create confusion. And Mike Tomlin said on Tuesday, hey, we didn't get to do that a lot in the first half of the season because for about four weeks, they were missing Alex Highsmith. For another three, three weeks, they were missing Nick Herbig. So they didn't even have their top three guys. Now they'll have those top three and Preston Smith. And I foresee a pass rush that's going to be more complex than what we've even seen to start this season from the Steelers. Yeah, a lot of challenges up front for the Washington Commanders, not just quarterback Jane Daniels with center Tyler Biosh on communication. Uh, you know, rookie left tackle Brandon Coleman. He's he's stood up to some challenges. Miles Garrett, Brian Burns, but this unit, I mean, TJ Watt, I think is, I put TJ Watt above both those guys, but then this unit as a whole, I think, is the best pass rush unit, uh, talent wise, that they've they're gonna see. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. And that winning $5 bet could be on an early week 11 line in the NFL. There's a theory that teams get a bump from firing a coach, but what happens when they fire a coach and trade one of their best players? FanDuel is kind of buying the fired coach hype as it feels like the New Orleans Saints aren't as much of an underdog as you might expect to the Atlanta Falcons. The game is in New Orleans, but the FanDuel has the Falcons favored by three and a half points. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. You are Locked On Bulldogs, your daily podcast on the Georgia Bulldogs. We are in Thunderdome. Clint Shamblin of Locked On Bulldogs is nice enough to join us. Daniel Monroe is unfortunately unable to be here, but maybe next year because we're in a weird three-year cycle where Ole Miss and Georgia play every year. So we'll see exactly how that goes. Clint, I was sitting here looking at this Vegas line. I've been pouring over it all week. It's the nuttiest thing. Georgia is favored by two and a half points, as they have been since Sunday. But if you look at the actual stats on it, 
nearly 90% of the bets and 90% of the money is on the Georgia Bulldogs and the line is not moving. That That is inviting more Georgia bets. It feels like they're banking money, but this line should be up to seven or eight points at this point. Yeah, Vegas saying, hey, come on in. The water is fine. Let's keep this flow of cash. It does give me pause. We check out the lines constantly. And so they have tall buildings in Vegas for a reason, and they keep on accepting cash at two and a half, and it hasn't moved, which Georgia fan, this just in, in case you don't follow betting, you don't care about any of that, that should give you pause for concern. What Vegas wants to do is move the line up because they want to say, well, if all this cash is going to come in, and if Georgia, if the public thinks that Georgia is going to win or, or, yeah, cover the two and a half, win by three or more, we're going to move it back so that we can hedge our bets and we can get more people in on the action. And the fact that they're not tells me that Vegas believes they have actually Georgia should be maybe in their mind, one and a half, one point or a pick them game. And they're going to give you the two and a half to tempt you into the water, to keep you there. It's crazy to me. It gives me pause as a Georgia fan line like this hasn't changed. Even the Alabama and the Texas game, the line changed not here though, Steven, yep. which is bananas. Listen, um, in the LSU game for Ole Miss, they did the same thing. Ole Miss was favored by two and a half, three points, and the line just did not move over the course of the week. And it's like Vegas knew something. LSU ended up winning that game in overtime. So we'll see how it goes. It might be the weather this weekend, honestly. The weather forecast updated. It is now an 80% chance of rain at game time. It is going to be out 72 degrees. It doesn't look like it's going to be too windy. So that's that's a blessing in disguise, but this is going to be a weather game. And I think Vegas might be worried about Carson Beck with the confidence because he's only human throwing the interceptions. You're going to think about that and having a wet football. There's obviously going to be some pause. Maybe Vegas thinks the rain plus Carson Beck means turnovers. Yeah. If you look at what he did last week at Florida, it was wild because when he threw the interceptions, he came back out and it was clearly in his head because he refused to throw the football for three drives, Stephen. It was in his head. It's not an arm issue. It's an in-between-the-ears issue. And when he doesn't feel confident, he refuses to throw. And then he started getting into a rhythm when he was just checking down and taking the underneath. He wasn't taking shots. And the offense worked fine. Again, we have more points per game when Carson Beck throws interceptions than when he doesn't meaning the offense is cooking, it's going just fine when he's taking shots. And so you're not going to, that's a recipe for disaster. I'm not saying throw interceptions, get more points because you'll lose games that way. What I'm saying is this offense can cook. And I think you're right. I, I anticipate Georgia, if we had healthy running backs, which is a question mark that we still don't have an answer on. And this just in Kirby Smart will not update you. I don't know how Lane handles the injury question. Same thing. Great. <laughs> Great. It's comical. We have a we have a guy, Chip. Chip Towers always asks the same question every single week, and Kirby has an answer. If we needed him to go, he would have come back in the game on Saturday, and he's progressing. That's his standard line, and every single person knows it. So we won't know until game time. Nobody will know until game time. That's a question mark. But Carson Beck to the left on first down. If Carson Beck's on first down throwing to his left, it's almost a guaranteed interception. The statistics show us. If he's able to do a check down, it works. And on play action, Carson Beck is the best quarterback, not what the best quarterback in college football on play action. The run game is there. We can play action. He could read over the middle. Things change. If he's forcing it down the field on first down, it's pick city, especially with rain, slippery ball. I don't know if you've heard this. Wide receivers at Georgia have a historic drop rate. Water and on the ball and on the gloves should fix all of that too, right, Georgia fan? No, it's going to be worse. I anticipate a sloppy passing game because of the mental and the drops of the wide receivers, uh, which clearly favors Old Miss in this game. Because I think, uh, if I understand, Jackson Dart is fine in this type of weather, Stephen. Yeah, yeah, he went the in 2022, Ole Miss ended up actually losing this game. But he had a game against Mississippi State where he was 30 for 40 for 350 yards in a monsoon and led a 99-yard drive to score what would have been the tying touchdown if they would have got the two-point conversion. It was kind of the arrival moment for Jackson Dart to let everybody know. It's like, hey, this guy is a little bit different. Um, so Ole Miss fans should be honestly excited about a rain game because I think Ole Miss might have the advantage – if that becomes the great equalizer with all of the talent, because I'm going to be honest about this. The Georgia Bulldogs, look, think of it like a bell curve. 
and you think of it like an Ole Miss bell curve. Georgia's is up here. Ole Miss is here. And if Georgia mm-hmm. plays up there, there's not a dang thing you can do about it. What's going to happen is going to happen. Ole Miss saw that in Athens, Georgia a year ago, how that can look. The trick is to get that bell curve for Georgia down to where you can get them. And you get that through elements, through the rain, through yeah. turnovers. Yeah. And if you can do that, you have a chance to knock off this team because th- Brock Bowers isn't walking through that door. There is no Lad McConkey. The running game, there's no Kendall Milton. Carson Beck is struggling because those weapons are gone. This is still a supremely talented team loaded with four and five star players, but this isn't the 2023 Georgia Bulldogs. Capitalization off of miscues is going to be old miss recipe. If they can be opportunistic, if there's a tip ball and they come down with it, if there's a fumble on the ground, if it's third and short and they, they need a yard or two and Lane sends the house and gets a stuff in the run game because Carson Beck's not there, all of these are going to be the things. If there's a blown coverage, a slipped DB, and Jackson Dart finds the guy on the sideline, those are the elements that if you can get in a crack, you're, you're right, and be, all the intangibles are there. At home, old misses. Okay, you're at home, you have weather, you have a a more, uh, I'll just say it, Georgia fans, we don't like to say it right now, a more talented quarterback as of right now, and we hate saying that because we thought Carson Beck was going to be the first quarterback chosen in the draft. Those days, Who's having a legacy game. If he beats Georgia, this is a legacy game for him. Lane Kiffin saves his entire season. There's playoff chances, there's playoff hopes. I mean, this is the pivotal moment for Old Miss. 100%. The tide of emotion is riding high on Old Miss. Now, uh, we might talk about this a little later and some meta narratives, but Old Miss fan, that's good for you to feel and that's good for the players and that's good for Lane. It just so happens that when Kirby Smart has that narrative, the haunt there. <laughs> There's, he plays up. It happens. And that Belker, th- this is Georgia's red zone defense against teams. The, the, the points, yards per play and the success rate against Clemson, one point yard, 1.1 yard per play in the red zone on defense, 25% success rate. Alabama, 4.4 yards. That's not a passing team. That's a running team. Uh, Auburn, 2.1 yards per play. M- Mississippi State, 4.5 yards per play, 50%. All of a sudden you play Texas. yards per play, 14% success rate in the red zone. Clemson and Texas are the best defensive performances. Why? Because Kirby got them up here and played well. So it is good. Everything is going in Ole Miss's favor on this. It just so happens that's the fuel that this Georgia team feasts on. And and you can't deny it. It's weird. It's bizarre. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. And that winning $5 bet could be on an early week 11 line in the NFL. There's a theory that teams get a bump from firing a coach, but what happens when they fire a coach and trade one of their best players? FanDuel is kind of buying the fired coach hype as it feels like the New Orleans Saints aren't as much of an underdog as you might expect to the Atlanta Falcons. The game is in New Orleans, but the FanDuel has the Falcons favored by three and a half points. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. But the passion that comes with this rivalry is what makes it great. And I'm so excited to have this back. Didn't we do this in a way? In the, didn't Cam Rising at Big 12 Media Day say something? And then your guy, Connor Pay, even said, like, yeah, we can't stand those guys either. Like, wasn't, didn't we do something like that? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So you had uh, Cam Rising get up a big toe media. I want to. I pretty much looking forward to going down there and whooping their ass. That's what that was mm-hmm. the term he used. And then Connor Payne's like, "Yeah, I hope he would say that because we yes. want to see the exact same feeling about mm-hmm. this." Here's the thing about this rivalry for any Utah or BYU fan who may be confused: the passion uh, amongst the players, mm-hmm. it is, it, it's just as intense 
as the fan bases out there, because JT, you and I both see the social media interaction <laughs> between the two fan bases, and uh, it, it's pretty epic. But these players, they're passionate and they're ready to go out there and put on for their teams and hopefully represent both universities well. They are. And from a Utah perspective, this 20, the 2021, the seniors from like that group yeah. have accomplished so much, right? Back 12 championships, like really good season, Rose Bowl burst, everything. What's the one thing they haven't done? They haven't beaten BYU. Pretty much every successful, well, I mean, literally they won nine years in a row, right? For Utah did, right? So all these other recent Utah players can say they at least did that. That's the one thing that BYU's done. And it's still, look, coming into this game, it's still wild to think we're in this position, right? Where, where BYU's win total coming in the year was four and a half. We did a preview before the season, talk about what this game would be, what it would look like. And now BYU ranked inside the top 10. Should be even higher, in my opinion, based on what the CFP rankings did. But that's no surprise with the SEC and Big Ten bias. But anyways, I do think that this game is still going to be a lot of fun. Yes, BYU is the better team right now, but this is a rivalry game. And even though I talked about Utah's recent success in the rivalry, Jake, you did a great job mentioning too. All of those rivalries and games were close, but really quick back to the passion. Utah's head coach in waiting, just speaking of expletives, also has a clip that's been making the rounds that he said too. So the passion involved in this rivalry is what makes it special. And I'm so excited to have it back, not just this year, but moving forward. Well, that's the other thing about this. And I was going to ask you, and I'll, I'll get your mm -hmm. thought on this. Now, 2021 doesn't seem that long ago, but it's three full seasons ago, JT. Yeah. And according to Kyle Whittingham, I think the Utes have 10 guys uh, who may have played in this game. BYU, I think, have has nine or 10 guys. So amongst uh, 260 some odd players on both of these respective rosters combined, 20 guys have got experience playing in this Crazy. rivalry. And it's wild to consider how much turnover has happened in those three years with the transfer portal and obviously just the inevitable guys moving on with life, et cetera. Do you think that's going to affect to any degree the overall tenor of this rivalry? Because I'm with you. The fact that it's back and it's going to have stakes on it moving forward as members of the Big 12 Conference, totally cool with that. It's something I grew up with, them being in the same conference. So I love that fact. But I just wonder if it's going to take maybe a, a game or two to really get that real true passion back into this matchup. It may. Before we actually dive into that, I'm curious for BYU's perspective. Utah has two guys, would be three if Cam Rising was healthy, that played in this game from in 2019. Yeah. Does BYU have any of those guys? 2019? Uh, 2019. I'd have to look at that. I, I can think of one guy in particular mm -hmm. that may have, but uh, I'd be hard-pressed to name them off the top of my head, and that's crazy to consider. Maybe some guys from 2019 are still around that have played in this. What's wild is that was Makai Bernard, or actually that was the 2021 game when yeah. Makai Bernard went out, but like Makai Bernard and Brant Keithy, like the two best players on Utah's offense were on this team in 2019. So it's not just like, oh, there's a random, like kick, the old kicker in college thing like yeah. that. But no, I, I think there could be something to what you said about it taking maybe a little bit of time to reach those levels, but I don't know. I mean, you already said it off the top about the social media comments and everything we've seen. The players got to be fired up. We already mentioned how for Utah, like this is the biggest game left on their season. And they still have another top or top 15 team, Iowa State, now coming up. You know, Colorado is another one too. But this, the implications are so massive for Utah to go in and try to beat your rival and derail their season. And look, BYU is the better football program right now in 2024. But I think Utah can say like, oh, hey, if you look at us overall consistently, we've been better in these other years. Even in our down year, we were still able to beat BYU. So I, if Utah was able to beat BYU, they could say, hey, that was more of a blip on the radar this down year and we'll bounce back. But if BYU rolls in and just demolishes Utah, then there really isn't going to be an argument for who has the better program in, in the state right now. And that's another thing that it pales in for recruiting massively. But I, it does feel like these players are fired up, even if it maybe is not to the same level as it used to be, which you could speak to that better than I can, Jake. Well, here's the thing. I know that these players are passionate, especially guys who grew up in state, like Karene mm -hmm. Reed for Utah. Yes. He has the experiences that come. He grew up a BYU guy. His dad and his mm -hmm. uncle both played at the Y. So he, he grew up a BYU guy. He decided to go to Utah and he's a dyed in the wool Ute now. And same thing. We had Chase Hansen on my radio show earlier this week and he mm -hmm. said the exact same thing. His dad was a BYU guy through and through. Chase was a BYU guy. And he said that uh, only, he said it didn't take him very long to completely flip allegiances when he went to Utah, but it's, the same thing. We've got Ephraim Asiata playing down in yes. Provo, Utah. Matt was an absolute legend at, for the Utes. And the fact that his son is now suiting up for the Cougars, the crossover. Just, Isaac Wilson. Isaac Wilson. In the start. Yeah. So it, it, you look at this and it's absolutely incredible. The ties between these two universities, mm -hmm. but that's what makes this rivalry. I think one of the most unique in all Agreed. of football JT, because 
we all know that Utah as a state, we're very proud to be Utahns and to represent what the Beehive State is all about. But more importantly, when it comes to this in-state rivalry, these players, they want nothing more than to get one over on the guys they grew up playing with and against. Absolutely. I mean, the passion, like you said, I think that's the biggest thing, right? Like growing up against these guys that mm -hmm. added competitive fire of going against your brother. Like, you know, you love him off the field, but man, when you're on the field, you, you want the bragging rights. You want to prove that you're the best. And I, the other thing that's so great about having this game back too, is it does put the best two programs in the state of Utah against each other. So it puts Utah itself the state at football, everything there on a higher stage and level. Unfortunately, Utah didn't live up to their end of the bargain. So this game does not have a better time slot, but it still carries a BYU top 10 team still on, you know, ESPN, even if it is a late night kick too. But yeah, these guys have been growing up against each other. They've been waiting for this moment for years. The fans have been waiting and building towards it too. So you're right. You don't have the recent history like this time next year we'll have hey remember when so and so did this and he's still on your team like oh we're ready for that like we don't have that even though we have a couple of those old guys we talked about too but the fact that you haven't had a chance to get your arrival in a long time and i'll say this jake i'll talk about this more on my show on friday but we can talk about a little bit now too could be kyle whittingham's last game in this rivalry which is wild to consider mm -hmm. and Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. And that winning $5 bet could be on an early week 11 line in the NFL. There's a theory that teams get a bump from firing a coach, but what happens when they fire a coach and trade one of their best players? FanDuel is kind of buying the fired coach hype as it feels like the New Orleans Saints aren't as much of an underdog as you might expect to the Atlanta Falcons. The game is in New Orleans, but the FanDuel has the Falcons favored by three and a half points. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. You are locked on Grizzlies, your daily Memphis Grizzlies podcast. We're going to get started in today's show talking about the beatdown that the Memphis Grizzlies put on the Los Angeles Lakers, 131 to 114 uh, win. Uh, a lot of Grizzlies players played played well in this game. You know, uh, John Morant was good before getting injured. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. Uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. had 20 points. Santi Aldama, another double-double. I mean, he's he, – look, if you're still sleeping on Santi as a rebounder right now, him at the three with his ability to rebound, it is – been pretty evident so far. 11 points, 12 rebounds there. Jalen Wells, we'll talk about him later in the show as well. 20 points. John Morant had 20. Uh, Zach Eady had 8.7 rebounds, 15 minutes off the bench. You got Jake LaRavia with 13 points, five boards, eight assists, just stuff in the stat sheet. Scotty Pippen, you know, uh, he, he keeping it going, 14.6 rebounds, four assists. Basically, a lot of different players, Jay Huff, Brandon Clark, Luke Kennard, made his season debut. So many contributors to this game, but we're going to focus in in this first segment, uh, particularly on John Morant, because uh, I talked about it yesterday uh, as we were talking about uh, some, some storylines going into this game. And I said, Grizzlies players, if you remember, shout out to the everydayers, because you, you, you tune in every day, you probably saw this sequence happen in the game, and you already knew what was going on, because I said it yesterday, Grizzlies players were not pleased last season when LeBron James – and the Lakers came to town in Memphis, and LeBron's doing the windmill dunk right in front of that Grizzlies bench with Desmond Bain, John Morant, Luke Kennard, Vince Williams, a bunch of injured. All those guys were injured and pretty much in street clothes. All those guys could only just sit over there and watch, and LeBron's laughing in their face, smiling in their face. And, again, you know, I mentioned that, you know, uh, Desmond Bain gave him a push at one point. John Morant gave him a push after the, wind deal, the windmill dunk uh, that I just mentioned. Those dudes didn't take that kindly. And if you've been watching the Grizzlies for a while now, uh, you know that there isn't a starstruck bone in these dudes' body. Like, it's it's kind of the good part about them in a way in terms of uh, when they approach, approach a game against a guy like LeBron James. Uh, it, it, I guess the best way to put it is 
you know, they respect what he's done for the game, but all that goes out the window when they're on, when on the floor. They don't care anything about that. So an, another example has kind of formed in, in, this, in this most recent game, and the sequence that we saw happened late in the second quarter. It was when uh, John Morant drove to the basket, had Gabe Vincent on him, uh, got an N one, shot it over the top of him, did the, you know, the famous too small gesture in the NBA, lowering his hand to the ground, basically saying the defender on me is too little. So then LeBron James gets an isolation against uh, John Morant, and John Morant said he felt like it was a charge. And if you look at the play, he did kind of bulldoze over uh, John, but, you know, 6'8", 250, big guy. Uh, LeBron James bulldozed over, over uh, John, gets the layup, and he does the two small celebration right in front of John Morant. And a uh, Grizzly teammate helps, helps John up, and he's laughing. And I'm knowing, oh, this isn't the end of it. Because this is this is John Morant we're talking about here, and that history uh, component that I mentioned uh, is is also a factor there. And then the history even goes deeper than that if you want to factor in the playoffs and all that stuff uh, from a couple years ago, 2023 playoff series. But anyways, John Morant comes up the floor, uh, it makes a, a bank shot over another Lakers player. It wasn't even over LeBron James, and LeBron James is about to get the inbound pass. LeBron and Ja literally runs over to where LeBron is, gives him a nice little shove, little bump in his back. LeBron moves a little bit. Referees see it. Technical foul on Ja Morant. Ja said in that moment he was trying to, you know, uh, he, he was firing his teammates up. But in addition to saying that, he said a whole bunch more. He talked about the fact that, again, what I mentioned as part of the uh, the thing from last year, Josh said he didn't like that. These guys came on our floor uh, and taunted us and things like that. He pointed that out himself as well as, you know, the fact that the Grizzlies, you know, weren't healthy, you know, at the time. And the Lakers weren't healthy in this game. And then the Grizzlies weren't either. You know, Desmond Bain uh, was out. Anthony Davis were out. So a lot of injuries uh, were in this game. But – Several notable quotes from John Moran in this one. And one of them, I don't back down from nobody. I don't care who you are. My job was, was to come back. I got my bucket, and I set the tone. My teammates fed off of it, and you see what happened. And what happened was, a, you know, a big-time Grizzlies victory. But John Moran straight up said, you know, um, I don't like him, referring to the Lakers. And as to why he said he doesn't like them, you know, he mentioned the fact that the Lakers – put them out of the playoffs. He mentioned, you know, the fact that, again, the Lakers players, referring to LeBron James uh, for the most part, he said they came on our floor and beat us on our home floor, was laughing, playing, looking at me, talking. And he said my message to them was I was in street clothes. So this time John Moran wasn't in street clothes. And I'm telling you what I said at the top about this, this isn't a rivalry. Like, it, we, I don't want any Lakers fans to come on here, get the things twisted like Warriors fans uh, used to do early on in, the, in that sequence. But the Warriors-Grizzlies thing started to, to me, at least feel like a button rivalry because you had the Grizzlies who beat the Warriors in the play-in series. And then the Warriors come back and beat them in a, you know, competitive second-round series. And then they get mashed up against each other on Christmas uh, the following season. So there were a lot of storylines uh, going on there in addition to, you know, everything happened in between the lines of Dylan Brooks, Gary Payton, uh, you, you know, Steve Kerr and Grizzlies broke the court. All, all these different storylines factored into, you know what, this really feels like a rivalry. Like these teams just aren't fond of each other. This one doesn't feel the same way. This feels just like the, the Grizzlies just, they don't like the Lakers. John Morant said he doesn't. And, if you were watching on the uh, the FanDuel Sports Network broadcast, Scottie Pippen Jr., who had a solid game, was getting interviewed after the game. And Desmond Bain, who's another player, has been a little bit vocal, you know, about, you know, uh, the competitiveness when it comes to playing against the Lakers, uh, basically goes over there, interrupts uh, the interview between Scottie Pippen Jr. and uh, the FanDuel Sports Network and calls LeBron James old. You know, he didn't say LeBron James by name, but it was very clear who he was talking about because here's what he said. He said, y'all seen the way he snatched the ball, referring to Scottie Pippen Jr. Y'all seen the way he snatched the ball from that old man over there? And that's what Scottie Pippen Jr. did in the fourth quarter. He snatched the ball 
from LeBron James. So I guess that's the old man over there, the 39-year-old, who is actually, yeah, the oldest player in the NBA. So, uh, you know, not not a lot of love lost between these two teams, even Jaron Jackson Jr., who, you know, he's not really the trash talker that Desmond Bain and John Morant, you know, have come to be in their uh, 10 years in the league. It's a little bit different uh, with Jaron, but even he acknowledged that, um, you know, that Lakers series, that playoff series is not something – that's lost on the Grizzlies. He said, you know, the playoffs left a bitter taste in our mouths. He said, any team we play in the playoffs, win or lose, is just forever beef. It's forever beef. Uh, they're never going to be too kindly, too friendly uh, when they see the Lakers. So uh, that's just what it is. I think that's the way this game played out. And you know what? They see them in another week. I'm going to be looking forward to that game simply because Maybe uh, Rui Hachimura will miss this game because of illness. Anthony Davis could potentially be back. But even on the Grizzlies side, a guy like Desmond Bain, uh, we'll learn more about Ja Morant. Uh, and I'll end this segment there since we're talking about Ja. We didn't get much, you know, uh, on his right hamstring injury. He left the game, if you weren't watching, in the third quarter. Um, a foul should have been called. It was kind of clear to me. And, and Ja pretty much uh, was very uh, – disappointed, I'll say, <laughs> disappointed after the game and the fact that a foul wasn't caught. I even talked to Jake LaRavia, who threw the alley-oop pass to Ja, ja Morant when Ja jumped into the air. Uh, he believed that Ja was undercut, and if you look at it, um, yeah, Ja hit the ground pretty hard, injured his hamstring. He spent uh, most of the game over there, uh, the rest of the game on the bike, in the tunnel. It was walking gingerly when I saw him. So, uh yeah, I, I think this kind of puts into question uh, his availability for Friday based on what we saw. Uh, but we'll learn more, you know, in the next couple of days on John ja Morant's availability going forward, going forward as far as that goes. And speaking of availability, uh, what about Zach Eady's availability? Zach Eady just came off one of the best games a rookie center's had in recent years, right? Right? And then he comes back doesn't play a lot against the Lakers. 